The following um, PowerPoint is for the living world objectives. Um, I did go through numbers one, two, and three in all of the classes. So I will start off with number four. Also, if for some reason you are absent and you need to see these PowerPoints, they're posted on Edline. All right, for number four, it says discuss major problems with invasive species. Um, one of the major problems is that they compete with the native species. Don't forget that invasive species are non-native species that are brought over um, either on accident or by pur on purpose um, to this new area. Uh, many times they don't have any natural predators, and so they're able to increase in number. Uh, and like I said, they outcompete the native species. So some examples, you can see the brown anole. If you guys remember the brown anole, um, was accidentally introduced to the United States uh, in the 1970s and now has uh, basically inhabited all of the southeast part of the United States. Um, it has outcompeted the green anole, so they had overlapping niches. And now we see brown anoles everywhere. The green anole now is uh, kind of, um, the numbers are, have decreased here and, and they're kind of, uh, I guess, moved or pushed into the Everglades. Every once in a while, you'll see a, a green anole. Another example would be the kudzu. The kudzu is a vine. It's one of the worst invasive species in the United States. It was purposely brought over here from Japan, um, and we thought it would help with soil erosion. And as you can see from the middle picture here, it has just grown over all of these trees, and it's uh, been growing like crazy. So it's becoming a problem, and so it's considered invasive. And another example, I'm sure you guys could list a whole bunch, the Burmese python. Um, you know that it is currently in the Everglades and that the python is uh, preying on small alligators and birds. Um, and so it's important that we try and remove them as, as much as we can. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see on the news that there's like a contest for whoever whoever catches the biggest um, python um, will win maybe a cash prize. And we see the same thing with the lionfish here. All right, number five. Um, you could guess that one. Number six, LD50 and ED50. Um, here's your definition, the dose of a pollutant that kills half of the members of a tested population. Sorry about that T, it should be population. LD obviously stands for lethal dose. And we use this in order to figure out how toxic a substance or a chemical is. So the LD50, we do this on test populations. So we're, we're not talking about humans. We're talking about lab animals like rats. And we're basically recording the amount of toxicant in milligrams over the kilogram of body weight. So when 50% of the test population dies with a certain amount of toxin, that would be the LD50. And the smaller the LD50, the more toxic the chemical, the higher the LD50, for the greater, the less toxic. We're kind of moving away from using the LD50. Um, the reason why is due to the animal cruelty. So we're using other measures and means in order to test toxicity of different chemicals like pesticides. If you look at the graph at the bottom right hand corner, you can see this is how we would represent um, a graph with our LD50. We have a dose response curve. On the y-axis where it says response, if you were ever given this on a test, you would see um, many times percentages here. So 50%, you can just imagine right in the middle. Um, you would move over to your line, your S-curve, and go down, and this would represent the LD50. It's the dose that would kill 50% of the test population. Obviously, you can see the threshold. The threshold is the maximum amount of a substance without measurable effects. And the threshold here would be right before this blue line um, comes off of the x-axis. So that's your threshold. 
Um, EG50 is effective dose 50%. Um, so this is the amount of whatever it is, usually not a toxin, but the amount of a substance that's going to show the desired effect on 50% of the population. All right, some characteristics of endangered species and some things that humans can do to help. Well, first, as you probably wrote in number five, the main reason why animals become endangered or extinct is due to loss of habitat. And so protecting animals' habitat is the best way to keep them from becoming extinct. So if you remember that is in situ conservation when we're protecting the habitat. And then ex situ, just to remind you, is when we are going to uh, take an animal or plant out of its natural habitat and breed it in captivity. So like a zoo or an aquarium, and then for plants, seed banks. So for number seven, these are the um, lists here of characteristics of endangered species, uh, extremely small range, requiring a large territory. So a small range, we said the Mariposa lily was an example. Uh, found in one hilltop in San Francisco, so it's only found in a small area. Two, requiring large territory. The example was the California condor. Remember, the California condor has a wingspan of 10 feet. A uh, very, very large uh, scavenger. Um, and because it's so large, it needs lots of areas to roam and to, to scavenge. And so uh, as we remove its habitat, it's more likely to become endangered. Living on islands, so anytime that we have animals, especially birds that are living on islands, if there's a destruction of their habitat, they have no place to go. Low reproductive success, I think we said the blue whale was an example. Um, only we'll have a calf every other year. So they're not having many offspring. They're more of that uh, K-selected uh, group. Specialized breeding areas. So our Kemp Ridley turtle was an example, or just turtles in general. And then specialized food, one of the best examples would be your giant panda. Remember that um, your giant panda is going to eat bamboo. So 99% of its diet is made up of bamboo, even though it is a carnivore. Your nitrogen cycle. So if you look at this picture here, um, you can see that most of the nitrogen cycle takes place in the soil. So uh, it's all underneath the ground here, except for that atmospheric nitrogen. Also note that the nitrogen cycle is run by bacteria. So bacteria are going to uh, basically change the forms in which nitrogen are in throughout the cycle, except for when we have our assimilation with our plants. So the nitrogen cycle. This, um, they may ask you a multiple choice question on this on the AP exam. They may not ask you any questions. You never know. Just to go through it, your first step here is nitrogen fixation. And don't forget that the atmosphere, 78% uh, of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen gas. And nitrogen fixation will be your first step where we have N2. That is going to be fixed into ammonia or ammonium ion, NH4+, plus, this should be. And it's fixed biologically by bacteria specifically rhizobium and cyanobacteria. We also have natural sources like lightning. Your next step is actually a two-step. Um, it is going to be your uh, nitrification here, where we have our ammonia, which is first by bacteria converted to nitrite and then to nitrate. So NO3 minus here is nitrate. Nitrite is not usable by plants, so it has to be converted for nitrate in order for plants to use that nitrogen. 
think about nitrate as well with like our um, pollution. So with water pollution, uh, remember nitrogen or nitrates are part of fertilizers and they can run off into waterways. So nitrate um, can be taken up by plants and through the process of assimilation, nitrate um, will be incorporated into plant proteins. The plants um, may die or an animal eats the plant and eventually the nitrogen is um, put back into the soil either by decomposition or urination. And so another name for this step, if you remember, it's assimilation. This is our plant proteins being broken down into ammonia. And this is the inner cycling of our nitrogen cycle. If we have denitrifying bacteria present, nitrate will go through the process of denitrification and will be put back into the atmosphere. And that is your nitrogen cycle. Some human activities on the nitrogen cycle. Don't forget that when we burn coal, uh, it produces nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxides goes up into the atmosphere, uh, combining with water, making a secondary pollutant, nitric acid and nitrous acid, which leads to acid rain. The removal of nitrogen from topsoil, many times we have nitrogen that runs off into waterways, and it's going to decrease the dissolved oxygen. The carbon cycle. For the carbon cycle, you don't need to write down every single step of the carbon cycle. You really just know, need to know the important processes involved. For the carbon cycle, you should think uh, photosynthesis and cell respiration, the two most important processes. So you know that photosynthesis is going to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Cell respiration is going to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. You should also know the main carbon sink. So all year we've talked about a carbon sink trees. But the main place where carbon is stored or the carbon sink would be the ocean. If you look at this picture here, it's um, interesting because we see that our marine plankton and also our uh, decomposed plant remains, they're going to eventually become our fossil fuels, our natural gas, oil, and coal. And what we're doing is we are taking this carbon that's been stored under the ground for millions of years and we're burning it and putting it into the atmosphere. And this is where we have our higher levels of carbon dioxide and how they've been increasing since the pre-industrial times. So we're taking that carbon that's been stored underneath the ground and we're using it for energy. So human activities, uh, burning fossil fuels, another deforestation. So one word here could be deforestation of the clearing of plants and trees. You're removing carbon sinks. Burning fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas is putting that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Remember, carbon dioxide is the number one anthropogenic greenhouse gas, and it absorbs infrared radiation. The phosphorus cycle. You don't need to write down this whole cycle. But what you do need to know about the phosphorus cycle is what makes it different than the other cycles. The phosphorus cycle never enters the atmosphere as a gas. So phosphorus never enters the atmosphere as a gas. Phosphorus is found in rocks. So you can see right here, phosphate rocks. It's the slowest moving of all of the cycles. And it's important in our um, ATP production, our adenosine triphosphate. And most of this phosphorus is released into the environment by weathering. So its main process is going to be weathering, where the rocks are being broken down and releasing phosphorus into the environment. We know that we mine for phosphate, especially in Florida, because phosphate is a major plant nutrient.
put that along with our nitrogen or nitrates. So human activities on phosphorus, well, again, we're going to mine for phosphate. If we're removing trees, we're going to increase the phosphorus in the soil. And then adding excess is going to cause eutrophication. And eutrophication is the addition of nutrients, plant nutrients, to a body of water where we see enrichment. So the growth of algae. And decomposers are going to break down that algae at a very rapid rate using up the oxygen in the water, causing the water to be hypoxic, which means that it's lacking oxygen, and therefore killing fish. Your next cycle, the sulfur cycle. Uh, your sulfur cycle, you should know, sulfur is also found in rocks, just like our, our phosphorus. For the sulfur cycle, um, we put sulfur into the atmosphere, you'll see in a second, by burning coal. So you can see that uh, those chemical reactions happening right here. Again, weathering of rocks also puts sulfur into the environment. Volcanoes are a natural source of sulfur. So when we burn our coal, we're releasing sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere or sulfur oxides. They are reacting with water, again, just like nitrogen, um, making a secondary pollutant, sulfuric acid. This acid rains down on us, and it decreases the pH of soil and water, bodies of water. Sulfur from natural sources like volcanoes, remember that they are coolant. Sulfate particles are going to um, show us the aerosol effect, where we're going to see the reflection of a lot of that light back out into space. So sulfate can be considered a coolant. Some human activities on the sulfur cycle, burning coal, the smelting of minerals, um, basically the refining of minerals, because minerals, uh, we're talking about rocks here. So when we're going to heat up our minerals or our ore to remove the impurities in order to use whatever ore we're, we're looking for, if it's a aluminum or iron, and we're going to have those impurities and we're going to release some of that sulfur into the atmosphere. Don't forget that scrubbers can be used to reduce sulfur in the atmosphere, um, and it's neutralized by limestone. And hydrologic cycle, your last cycle. Don't forget your steps of the hydrologic cycle. Remember that um, the ocean contains 97% of all water on Earth. And the hydrologic cycle is run by the sun. So the sun is going to um, maintain the homeostasis of the hydrologic cycle. So we can start with our uh, transpiration or evaporation, whichever one, we'll start there. So transpiration is the evaporation of water from leaves, of trees and plants. You can see transpiration from vegetation right here. Evaporation off of bodies of water, soil, streams, rivers, and lakes. That water is going to move up into the atmosphere and it's going to um, condense. So we are going to have condensation. So our clouds will form. So then we'll have our precipitation. Rain, sleet, snow, hail. After precipitation, the water can either run off into from a body of uh, uh, area of land into a body of water or it can percolate or infiltrate down into our groundwater. So human activities in the water cycle, withdrawing too much water, especially along coastlines um, from the ground. We talked about saltwater intrusion. So when we are overdrawing um, groundwater near oceans, 
our pumps or our wells can start to uh, take in some brackish water, which then that well is not useful anymore. And also modifying water quality. So just water pollution. Many uh, developing countries, they may not have the infrastructure to uh, clean out their sewage and to clean out uh, different pollutants that we are able to clean out in our industries here. And so they are going to just pollute the water. Okay, number nine, differentiate producers, consumers, um, primary, secondary, tertiary, and trophic levels. So looking here, um, don't forget that most of the energy on Earth originates from the sun. We talked about chemosynthesis and hydrothermal vents, um, but most of the energy is going to come from the sun. And that radiant energy is going to be converted into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis. And that sunlight is going to hit our green plants that contain our chlorophyll and chloroplasts. And these plants, like I said, are going to convert that radiant energy into chemical energy. So if you look at this uh, diagram of a food chain, number one, notice how short it is. Food chains cannot be very long in nature. And the reason why is because of the second law of thermodynamics. If you're looking here, you see heat. And don't forget that um, no energy transfer is 100% efficient here because of the second law of thermodynamics. So we approximately have, I don't know, 90% of the energy that is passed is lost as heat, and only 10% moves on through the food chain. And so because of that, we can't have very long food chains. So your first trophic level, level is going to be your producer. So plants, algae, these are photosynthetic. They are autotrophs, which means that they produce their own food. Your second trophic level, primary consumers. So these are herbivores, which means that they eat vegetation or plants. Your third trophic level is going to consist of secondary consumers. Secondary and tertiary consumers, they can be either omnivores or carnivores. An omnivore eats both plants and animals or meat, and carnivores eat meat only. And then you can see at the end, we have our decomposers here, or saprotrophs. We have some fungi and bacteria. And they're going to return those nutrients back into the soil, which then will be taken up by the plants. One very important thing that I stress, the uh, direction of the arrows. Make sure that you are looking at the direction of the arrows. Um, if you have to draw a food web or a food chain on the AP exam, you need to draw the arrows in the direction in which energy transfers. So a common mistake, many times students want to draw it the other way because the mouse is eating the grass. That's incorrect. It's going from the sun to the grass, from the grass to the mouse, from the mouse to the snake, and so on and so forth. Okay, your ecological levels of organization. So um, this was from the beginning of the school year. I know it says habitats here. Uh, I'm just going to kind of add them in here as we go along. So species is not one of the levels that we have, but I'll just tell you what it is. So for species, it should be um, organisms that are capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. A habitat is just a place or an area where species live. Now 
now we have our population, which you can see on the screen. This is the same species in an area. So you can see the little shrimp or uh, crustaceans, whatever they are. Your next would be a community. So for a community, we have different species in the same place at the same time. So here we have our barracuda, some eel, uh, like a, that shrimp, maybe some phytoplankton you can see here. Your next, an ecosystem. An ecosystem includes the different species in an area at a given time plus the abiotic conditions. So you can see carbon dioxide here, which is an abiotic factor in this environment. And so that is included for the ecosystem. We also talked in class about a few more. Landscape encompasses larger area and several ecosystems. So it's several ecosystems in an area. Don't forget where we have two ecosystems next to each other, overlapping. It's called an ecotone. Biosphere. This is the whole Earth. So it includes the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the lithosphere. And that is it for um, the living world objectives. I will do a separate video for the biome.